Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I have a burden and a thought that I can't seem to shake. And so let's just see what the Lord has in mind. It's from Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> you know, sometimes the Lord deals with us in all kinds of different ways. You come into a service sometimes and you think you have a burden and it's the Lord just takes it off in another direction. You know, that's the Lord. And sometimes you come in with something, you think you have something, and like I say, it just goes, it goes another whole direction. But uh, in any case... These thoughts are, are so, and I just pray that God will, uh, will do what he wants to do with them. Let's begin in verse 22. i just read a little bit of scripture. It says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, Make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you are from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there will be those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. That's a sobering scripture, isn't it? Amen. And, you, you know, somebody might read this and wonder, how in the world could people try to enter the kingdom and not be able? That doesn't make sense. That doesn't seem fair for people to actually make an effort of some kind to enter the kingdom of God and yet be rejected. Now, it's interesting, Jesus didn't, didn't even volunteer this. This came in response to a question. And I'll tell you, I believe God provoked the question, don't you? Uh, perhaps there was just something in Jesus' teaching that caused him to think that maybe it's this way, or just a, just a wonder. But the answer, is, as I say, is a very sobering one. Uh, and I believe that it's well if we understand what he's talking about. I, I'll, I'll say this at the outset. I don't think Jesus said these words to make people afraid in the wrong sense. I don't believe he, made, he, he said them in order to cause people to be afraid as though somehow their own efforts to, 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 to be you know, good enough for God or something like that, that they're going to have to be measured by that and somehow they're going to fall short and they're going to be rejected. What he's talking about is a different kind of thing altogether, isn't it? It's a different kind of effort that's involved. Now, it's interesting that the, uh, there's two different words, very different types of expressions here, where he says, on the one hand, make every effort. I think the King James says to strive. And, uh, you know, the original word there is the word from which we get agony or agonize. Pretty serious effort he's describing there. And on the other hand, he just talks about people who try. So there's a very different level of effort there. But what he's really talking about is a deadly seriousness and a soberness about it, where coming to the, entering the kingdom of God becomes the single most important thing in life. And that's what's happening with so many that actually gathered around Jesus listened to his words, probably said, isn't that great? Isn't this wonderful? This teacher is doing so many wonderful things, saying so many wonderful truths. Man, I'm with him. You know, and they just somehow identified themselves with him or imagined that they were part of what he was talking about, but did not actually have a clue because he said the door into this kingdom is not just some broad, this is a narrow, this is a narrow door. Now he uses the, uh, the analogy or the illustration of a house. And somebody owns that house, and for a time, there's a door. There's a way into that house. 
And that door at, at, at this point in time was open, but it was a narrow door. You couldn't just say, well, I think I'll run around to the back door, I'll come in that way, or I'll slide in through a window, or I'll just sort of, you know, there was only one way. Everything else was shut up tight. There was one simple way to get into the kingdom of God. And I believe that's, what ha that's, that's where people fall down. It's not an effort to somehow get God to accept you. We're not earning our way into the kingdom by anything that we could possibly muster or do. There's nothing in the way of human strength that will ever cause God to accept you. So what in the world is he talking about? You know, it reminds me of the scripture, and I believe the same word is used, and, I, uh, and, and it talks about uh, striving to, well, let me, let's turn it over to Hebrews chapter 4. Just keep your place here. But Hebrews chapter 4. Now here, I believe the writer is essentially talking about the same thing, isn't he? He's talking about people who are outwardly identified with Christ in some fashion, but the concern on the part of the writer is that there will be people who will go so far, but yet they will stop short of actually getting in, entering in. There's, it's like there's a door. A lot of people hang out, hang out on this side of the door and imagine that they're in. And the fact is, they need to enter in. And let's see. Down in, uh, and he uses the analogy of how God, you know, gave the, the Israelites a place of rest, didn't he? He gave them an inheritance. It was something that he had provided. There was no other way they could obtain it except God had given it to them. And then later on, he warns the people and said, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. See, what happens is God speaks, but there is a, there is a level of resistance there. There's a level of trying to trying to rejigger it a little bit and saying, yeah, I like this part of the message, but I don't quite, you know, I don't quite go along with that. There's, a, there's a, some kind of resistance. Where is that resistance? It's inside, isn't it? Something in here is resistant to some aspect of the gospel message. And I'll tell you, the gospel message is an uncompromising one. It puts us all in the same place, doesn't it? But here is, here is God having provided Something that is perfect, that is wonderful, it doesn't depend on my effort or yours, doesn't depend on my, my deserving it, nor you. It's a gift of God, just as the original creation was a gift of God that all Adam, had, Adam and Eve had to do was enjoy it and obey God. That's it. There wasn't something they had to do to earn it. Thank God we don't have to earn our way into the kingdom. That's not what this is talking about at all. But he says there remains in, in verse 9 then a Sabbath rest and he uses, it's, it's kind of, it, it points back to the fact that God rested at the end of the creation. It was something that was finished. All we had to do was enter into that and enjoy it. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God for anyone who enters God's rest also does what rests from his own work. Right there, that tells you this isn't the, the kind of effort he's talking about is not an effort to try hard to be a Christian. Boy, I've met all kinds of people who, are, who fall into that category. There's, churches are full of them. You know, I've, I've met people, I can think of some, who are just, you know, they had trouble in their life, things weren't right, and there was, there was problems, and then all of a sudden they come to me one day, you know, I'm really trying. I'm, I've joined a church, I'm going, every, I'm going faithfully, I'm... You know, and they start telling you all about this religious life they've, they've taken on and how they're trying to be faithful in church, and they think that's what God's after. Oh, my God. And they don't have a clue. They're, they're trying. They're trying so hard to be a Christian. But that's not what it is. Anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work. I'll tell you, the, the, the pathway into the kingdom of God is to stop trying to get God to like you and accept you. He already does. He loves you. He loved you when he sent his son to the cross when you didn't care about him at all. You weren't even around. But I mean, you know, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's, how, that's what love, that's what the love of God is. We don't have to get God to love us. I don't care how far in sin you've fallen. God loves you. And I'll tell you, there's nothing you can do to earn your way into this. 
Make every, now here it is, here's the expression. It says, let us therefore, in view of what God has done, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Now that sounds crazy. Try real hard to stop trying. But here's the issue, and I, and I, I kind of alluded to this. You think of what it is that stops you, stops people from coming into the kingdom of God. What is it really? I mean, you might say, well, their friends laugh at them. Or the devil works real hard on them. That's not the issue. The issue is in here. The issue is, are we willing to let go of the things that would, would keep us? If the, I don't care what the devil does. If, if you were in here, want God and are willing to surrender, there's no devil in hell that can keep you out of the kingdom of God. He has no power except what you give him. I'll tell you, if the devil has a hold in your life, he has a hold because you gave it to him. You might not have realized you were giving it to him, but you did. And I'll tell you, there's somebody, and he's here this morning, who has the power to set you free from whatever the devil has done in your life. But you're going to have to give him what you gave the devil. It's going to have to belong to him, lock, stock, and barrel. You don't have the power to change. You don't have the power to beat what, what's working on you. My God, we need, we need to preach salvation. There's so much that goes out there and preaches how people ought to live and how they ought to do and all this stuff without giving people the means by which that happens. It's salvation. I am an am a unworthy, unable sinner. There's not one good thing that I can look in here and depend upon to help me either come to God or to, or to live the Christian life. I need him to come and take possession of my vessel and live in and through me. There's nothing else that qualifies as the gospel or salvation. That's why I say churches in America are full of people who are religious but don't know, but run, run afoul of exactly the thing Jesus was talking about. What is it that stops us? I say it's in here, isn't it? You know, I'll use the, I'll allude again to the imagery that, that John Bunyan used in Pilgrim's Progress. Do you remember how all the things that, that, that stood in the way? Uh, there's several, several things. I'll, I'll give you one. One was the castle. You remember how he was taken to the house of the interpreter and showed a castle? And he showed a bunch of dark figures who were standing there in, in between this man who came up to try to get into that castle? And the castle, what did he have to do? He had to fight. You know, the kingdom of heaven is forcefully advancing. It suffers violence. And what, the, the, uh, the violent take it by force, or, or forceful men lay hold of it, in a modern translation. In other words, it takes, it takes that kind of an effort. But what, what is it that's being overcome here? Itself. It's the utter resistance that we have to surrender to God. Self is absolutely encamped. We are polluted with self. It's what we are about apart from Christ. I'll tell you, there is everything in this world that will fight not to surrender. And what happens is that there's people who have never given up the throne of their life, who have taken on some of the, some of the packaging, some of the uh, outward things that have to do with following Christ. And they're among the people of God, but they have never surrendered to Christ. And I'll tell you, Jesus didn't do this, didn't tell them this to, to scare people in the wrong sense. As I said, he told them out of a heart of love. I don't believe he even, I don't believe he railed on the people. I, you know, I guess we tend to, to be real forceful when we talk about things like this. And I, I apologize. I don't want to do that in, the, in my, in human energy. But it was a deep burden on his heart. You want to know how deep it was? Look at what he, look at what happened right after that. Verse 34. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This wasn't an anger that Jesus 
utter these words. It was anguish. There was a weeping. There was a longing on the part of his heart for people to wake up and to recognize that there's going to be people, always has been this way, who will become outwardly a part of the people of God. I'll tell you, I don't care how weak you are, how new you are, how old you are. If you, if you surrender to Jesus Christ, you put your life in His hands, you're in a safe place. It's not designed to make you afraid. But there's people that need to be awakened who don't understand. Because look at the people. Look at the reaction of the people. Jesus is saying there's going to come a time when the door's going to be shut. This is God's house. It's not ours. We don't control the door. He shut it. It's closed. That's it. But what was their reaction? They're standing on the outside knocking open. Hey, we're part of this. Well, let us in. What did, what did he say? I don't know you. Is that, did Jesus utter these words just to make talk? No, there was a real issue involved. And you think about some of the, some of the people that, some of the things that Jesus taught that gave, gives us an insight into, into what kind of an effort people make. I mean, what, what, what's this business about trying and not being able? What about the rich young ruler? Did he try? Yeah, he wanted to get into the kingdom. What do I have to do? What do I do? And Jesus gave him the law and he, he patted himself on the back about how well he kept that. But Jesus knew something about this man. I can tell you there are churches today that would have welcomed that man. There would have been dollar signs in the treasurer's eyes about this fellow because he had money. He said, boy, our problems are over. We can meet the mortgage now. Oh, God. But Jesus looked at the real issue in the man's life. There was something in his life that he loved more than God. What's the first commandment? I shall have no other gods before me. I'll tell you, salvation starts by putting him first. And that's the problem. People will go so far and something will come up that they love. And they'll come up with a rationale how it's, it's okay. I'm rich, so I can put lots of money in the offering. I can do this. I can work hard. I can, I can be a part and never really surrender that thing that's most important. I'll tell you, if you ever come to God, he's going to put his finger on the number one issue of your heart and your life. And I'll tell you, that's, I believe the Lord is concerned. I, don't, I know Brother Thomas was concerned throughout his ministry. He'd look out and he, he would know. And I'm not even, it's not any particular person. He would know that there were people, and you talked to him. Some of you did. You know he was aware that there were people who had just come, who just had Bible tabernacle religion. They were attracted to the strong ministry that he had. They were attracted to the singing, attracted to something, and felt, I'm a part. I'm part of the activities. I'm, I agree with this and I agree with that, and just count themselves as a part. But Jesus had never conquered their heart. Never really come to that place. And I just sense, in a, in a small measure, God's heart in this thing. His, there's, a, there's a longing, there's a weeping that people could actually come to such a place where they really thought they were. There's a deception. I'll tell you, if, if you love something and your, your heart is fixed on it, you're, the devil is going to feed you something that will make it seem like it's okay. And you'll embrace that deception more than you embrace the real message of Christ that says surrender your life and, and give up your life. He that loves his life will lose it. Did Jesus mean you? He meant me. Man, if I want to just take hold of my life and say I'm going to do as I please and I'll serve you on the side, that becomes my God. Whatever I set ahead of him. Oh, God, we are so, we have no idea the shape we're in and what we need in the way of salvation. We are so full of self-deception and pride and all these things. God has to touch those things. Thank God, if you're weak and you're crying out to him, you're, you, you're, you got all the hope in the universe. 
I don't want you to, to be afraid in that sense. Jesus is safe. He, his salvation is full and, and he's able to take the lowest of the low and save them completely. Praise God, we've got a hope we can proclaim today. But the problem here was people who wanted to somehow have that. They wanted to go to heaven. But they wanted their life, their rights, their way here. No such thing. No such thing. And that was the problem with that man. What happened? He, when Jesus put the finger where, where the problem was, he went away. And Jesus didn't get mad at him. Jesus loved him. I believe there was a sorrow in his heart. Well, Jesus loves you too. That's how he regards you. And that's why I don't want to yell at you this morning. I just pray God will give me grace to somehow reflect not just the words, but the, the spirit behind the words. Because there's a sorrow in his heart over, over the deep, the depth of the need that people have and how easy it is to stop short and be sidetracked. You know, uh, one of the parables that Jesus gave was the parable of the sower, wasn't it? Now you had some that just had no capacity whatsoever. The word just didn't have any effect on them. They were the seed that fell on the, on the wayside where people had trampled and it didn't, get, it didn't get in. But there were two kinds of soil where something came up, weren't there? Now one of them was soil that had a little bit of depth on the surface. But underneath was what we would probably call hard pan or rock or something. Whatever it was, there was a place where the roots could go down a little bit, but they couldn't really get down. And I'll tell you, that's a picture of a lot of people who hear the hope of the gospel. Man, they love the singing. They love the fellowship of the people. They, they're, they're warmed by the presence of God. They enjoy that. They, they, they are... are Absolutely, it's awesome the idea that we can have our sins forgiven and go to heaven one day and the Lord will be with us through this world. They just cherry pick all the wonderful things and just latch right on quickly to all of that. But by and by, what happens? Trouble, persecution, something begins to challenge that word. And what happens? There's no root. The sun comes out. It just burns it right up. I'll tell you. If people come to Christ, God's going to have to get down into that heart level and break it up. Yes. Yes. That represents a hard, a stiff self-will resistance that's never really challenged. How many places today do you go and you hear the gospel and it's kind of a superficial thing, so, so many. And you can get people to say yes and come and become church members, but their heart is never, ever really challenged. In fact, if somebody came in and really tried to challenge the heart level issues, what would, what would happen to him? They'd throw him out. I'll tell you, we need people in this hour that will preach the truth. Like Brother Thomas used to say, but hair lips, grandma. And it's not trying to to do it just to be, just for effect or just so people say, wow, isn't that great? We need it because it's the truth. This is, we're talking about life and death here. Does this matter? Yeah, Jesus is talking about people who get to the other, the other end and they have an awful surprise. I, what happened? I, I came, I listened, I sat under Brother Thomas all those years. What, you, what do you mean I'm not? Oh God, wake up. I believe there's people that need to search their hearts and say, Am I, have, is Christ really the Lord of my life? Have I ever really, really surrendered to him? Because there's no salvation any other way. If you're still sitting on the throne and trying to fit Jesus into your life and, and just make your life, you know, make that the dominating factor of your life, you, you don't know the Lord. There's no other way to put it. You don't know him. And there's no use pretending that you do. I'll tell you, the Lord is concerned because he has a perfect salvation. But he's not saving people. He's not coming to make your life better in this world and just dump all this great stuff on you and let you be the Lord. We're going to have to, we're going to, I mean, that's the fundamental, what's, that's what's wrong. What kind of salvation is it that never touches on the deepest issue that's wrong with us to begin with? That's what we need to be saved from. Is me. With my strong will asserting my way and saying, I'm going to do what I want to do. And it's, 
Jesus, you, I'm going to fit you in here. Praise you, Lord. I'm going to adopt the lifestyle. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'll work. I'll give lots of money, Lord. I'll be real, real uh, zealous for your kingdom. That's not what he's looking for. He's just looking for you. Yes. And I know you've all heard, many of you have heard the story that Brother Thomas used to tell about the, and I'm guessing this would have been a, something from David Brainerd. I don't know because he was a missionary to what were called Indians at that time. And a uh, man was under conviction. And he came to the clearing where the missionary was, was camped and praying. And he wanted to do, he just wanted salvation. He knew he needed something. So he came and he gave his blanket and something that was very, very important. I'm willing to sacrifice this. If I just can have peace, if I just can have forgiveness of sins. It wasn't, it wasn't enough. Brought his, I don't know if it was a rifle or a horse, but he brought things in succession that were of greater and greater value. And he, could, he was still under deep conviction. And then one evening he came in. He didn't have anything with him. He said, I give myself. Of course, the way they tell the story, Indian give himself. But that's what it is. And if the Lord has you, he's got all the rest of the stuff. Oh, I'll tell you what. We will fight kicking and screaming. You, you, think there's, you think it's easy just to kind of embrace the gospel and always oh, in this grand, great. There's going to be a pitched battle between, that involves self trying to live. And Satan will throw everything he can at you to stir that up. He will dump fear after fear after fear into your heart about what, what this is going to mean. Oh, my God, what about this? What about that? Will I be able to marry? Da, 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 da. You know, all these things are going to come into your, into your mind. Satan is going to feed that. Your problem is not Satan. Your problem is self that tends to agree with him and finds it so easy to listen to him. I'll tell you, if you surrender... And I, I guarantee there's lots of people here who could testify. You went through this in some form. There was a battle. You didn't want to surrender. You didn't want to give up. You didn't want to let go. But what happened when you did? Peace. Peace. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, Please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time, and may God richly bless you until then.